Good afternoon and welcome to this final session of the 2021 Invent Penn State Venture and IP Conference. I'm Penn State President Eric Barron and it's my pleasure to introduce Penn State alumnus Kenneth Frazier, Chairman and CEO of Merck, a global powerhouse in biopharmaceutical innovation. Under Ken's leadership, Merck has aggressively invested in innovative life-saving medicines and vaccines, including numerous oncological vaccines and immunotherapies and leading edge treatments and vaccines for infectious diseases, such as HIV and Ebola. Recently, Ken was hosted by President Biden to announce a historic partnership with Johnson & Johnson to expand manufacturing capacity and supply of its COVID-19 vaccine. Ken was named one of the world's greatest leaders by Fortune Magazine in 2018, and he was honored as the first ever recipient of Forbes Lifetime Achievement Award for Healthcare in 2019. A longtime advocate for social justice and economic inclusion, Ken has received numerous awards, including the Anti-Defamation League Courage Against Hate Award, the Bot Winnick, Prize in Business Ethics from Columbia Business School, the Legend and Leadership Award from Yale School of Management, the NAACP Legal Defense, and the Educational Fund National Equal Justice Award. Ken is a life member of the Penn State Alumni Association, and he and his wife, Andrea, are members of Penn State's Mount Nittany Society in recognition of their long-term philanthropic support of the College of Liberal Arts, undergraduate education, and the recently renovated Penn State Veterans Center. Ken also served as a member of the university's board of trustees from 2019 to, from 2009 to 2015. So, and I will also say that, that I, I think I'm one of his biggest fans as he is just an outstanding uh, leader. So, Please join me in giving a big virtual welcome to Ken Frazier. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, oh. President Barron. I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. So to get our discussion started, I have a few questions, along with several that have been submitted by Penn State community members. To begin, first question. The COVID vaccine and therapeutic effort is proving to be a global effort with every major pharmaceutical company supporting either developing or manufacturing or both. Can you update us on where Merck is with respect to new therapies or manufacturing partnerships? Yes, again, I'm glad to be here. So Merck has been fully committed to developing effective responses to the COVID-19 pandemic since it was first recognized. And we know success, as you said, Dr. Barron, will require continued global collaboration between countries, companies, and others we remain focused on deploying our expertise and resources in an attempt to have the greatest possible impact on the pandemic. Um, as you know, and you mentioned, through recent agreements with the US government and Johnson & Johnson, we're accelerating our efforts to scale up our manufacturing capacity to enable timely deliver, delivery of much needed medicines and vaccines for the pandemic, including COVID-19 vaccine made by J&J. &J. We're proud to be working alongside our colleagues at J&J &J to support manufacturing and supply of their vaccine to help meet the global commitments. And we hope to further enable the delivery of vaccines to people who need it. Additionally, Merck is moving ahead with our own research and development efforts. And one in particular I'll point to, we're in advanced clinical trials uh, for a potentially significant oral therapy for COVID-19 known as molnupiravir. Uh, what I think would be very useful in addition to having vaccinations is if people who were newly diagnosed with COVID-19 could take a medicine uh, like we do with uh, Theraflu or, or one of those kinds of medicines that actually will help knock down a virus. And we're also in continuing discussions with governments, public health agencies, and other industry colleagues to see where we can play a, a better role in helping to contribute to the pandemic response. So we're very busy. Well, I, I, I think, I think that it, it's wonderful to think, I must admit, after the last year, it's wonderful to think about a world in which you can get a vaccine, 
vaccination and at the same time, if something happens, there there's some therapeutic that can minimize or, or, or shut it down. So uh, in, in my mind, the vaccine makes me feel good. I feel a little sense of freedom, even though I'm still behaving myself and wearing my mask and social distancing. But uh, that sounds like a, a double opportunity for, for us to all, all go back to normal. Um, so uh, w- wonderful update. A second question. At universities, researchers are constantly pushing the envelope on new approaches to therapies, exploring the basics of disease dynamics, for example, but we know it requires partnerships to take those innovations to the marketplace. For example, Penn State professor Neil Christensen developed some of the monoclonal antibodies that were foundational in the development of Merck's Gardasil HPV vaccine. Could you uh, please uh, talk about Merck's view of universities as sources of new therapeutic approaches or novel uh, drug, drug targets? Absolutely. So let me start by saying we have a proud history of collaborating with universities. In fact, we were pioneers in this area back in 1939, I believe it was, we secured an agreement with Selman Waxman at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, not Penn State, but it tries. The agreement provided a grant to Dr. Waxman and Merck agreed to provide assistance, including large scale equipment to produce any discoveries. That collaboration culminated in the development and production of streptomycin, the first effective cure for tuberculosis. Penn State's Professor Neil Christensen's Exemplary work on HPV is another excellent example, I meant to say, excellent example of how collaboration between universities and the industry can help protect millions against cervical cancer and other specific HPV-related diseases. In addition, we've worked with Dr. Paul Offit at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which led to the development of a vaccine for the prevention of rotavirus. We take partnering with the university system very seriously and we're always seeking new opportunities. Uh, we have several business development and licensing teams that are embedded in our discovery research centers and our key innovative hotbeds. And their job is to engage academia and become part of the discussion on emerging areas of science. So each of our locations have full search evaluation and transaction capabilities to expedite evaluation of local opportunities. The company has five core areas of internal expertise. They are oncology, immunology, cardiometabolic, infectious diseases, and neuroscience. And we're always open-minded and opportunistic with regard to how we can partner at early stages. So I would say that we want to follow the science regardless of therapeutic area of modality. Uh, And we think that when we can work closely in a two-way dialogue with universities, that's the right way for us to proceed in getting your input early on that will facilitate the right kind of experiments that will provide early indications of whether a medicine could or a vaccine could ultimately be valuable. Um, so I, I, that just, as I would have expected, a very fertile territory, but maybe I should reverse the question and ask you, what do you think universities could do better so that we could be even more successfully engaged? Well, I have to say that I think what I ended up with a few minutes ago is I think that to the extent that we drop the barriers between uh, for-profit companies like Merck and have ongoing discussions, I think those are the kinds of discussions that can give us you know, insights into how you're working on early experiments and early science that will ultimately at some point possibly lead to medicines or vaccines. So I think it's really about both sides being open. It's not really about the university. It's really about both sides respecting each other's cultures, uh, each other's ways of working, and and trying to make sure that we have a a, a translation early on about the work that's going on in academia. And I just remind you that we depend on academia uh, for target identification. It's generally not the case that the pharmaceutical industry or the biotech industry actually fundamentally finds the right targets. We rely on academic research, basic research, uh, and the more we can work with you, the more likely that those will one day yield a medicine or vaccine. Another question, given the pandemic, 
which is hurting disenfranchised communities disproportionately, and the Black Lives Matter movement, corporations, university, and the investor community are asking what they can do to address racial inequality. From your unique perspective as one of just four Black CEOs in the Fortune 500, what are some steps that you are taking and what are some of the concrete things uh, other leaders can do to fight institutional racism? So this issue is deeply important to me. Uh, diversity and inclusion have long been important values at Merck and I'm proud of the strides we're making, including having, I think, one of the most diverse board of directors of any company, as well as our senior leadership team. But like many companies, this past year, I think, required us to take stock and be open to bigger challenges and bigger changes. Like others, we have a lot of room to improve. So we're making diversity and inclusion not just my objective as CEO, but every manager's goal in the company. It's not just about doing the right thing or about bettering society, although we have a responsibility to do both of those things. Diversity is key to how we operate as a company, how we engage external stakeholders, including customers, and how we drive competitive advantage. Last year, we engaged our senior executive committee and the board around diversity and inclusion in strategic sessions around priorities and stressing the importance of accountability. And I think that point about accountability is what's really required across all of society and including in corporations. I'd also say as business leaders, we can also build strategic partnerships with other organizations like Penn State, which aim to make positive impacts and changes on local and global levels. For example, here at Merck, we work with a nonprofit called Year Up, which aims to close the opportunity gap by ensuring that young adults gain the skills, experiences, and support that will empower them to reach their potential through careers in higher education. We also partner with an organization called Inroads, which is an international not-for-profit organization that prepares talented, diverse youth for corporate and community leadership. For more than a dozen years, we've partnership, we've partnered with Hispanics. Uh, in in at HISPA, which is in Hispanics inspiring student performance and achievement. So we have lots of these organizations and professional societies that will help foster the growth and development of diverse employees. Additionally, and this is really important, I believe as a country, we need to address the failure of our education to employment pipeline in this country. Uh, I'm the fortunate beneficiary uh, of being born at a time and a place where the social engineers in Philadelphia decided to bus a few inner city black kids to the best schools in Philadelphia. And so I won in a sense, the random lottery of birth compared to my older siblings uh, because I and my younger sister were put on those buses and it, we didn't know it at the time but we were being given a rigorous education unlike the kids in our neighborhood. So in that respect, I think it's really important to look at the education to employment pipeline. You may know that for African-Americans 78% uh, of people at age 26 do not have a four-year degree. And so often when companies require reflexively a four-year degree uh, as entry requirement, they're actually creating a structural barrier to African-Americans, not necessarily intentionally, but a firm structural barrier. And what we've been trying to do through what we call the 110 Coalition, which I launched with a number of other well-known business executives, is to ask those people to break down these structural barriers to access by building a skills first hiring paradigm instead of a credentials first hiring paradigm. Because as long as you have a credentials first hiring paradigm, it will have a disproportionate effect on African-Americans who don't have the time or the funds necessarily to earn a four year degree before seeking employment. So I'd say that we're very pleased. Uh, these 45 companies or so have joined with the goal of creating 1 million family sustaining jobs and careers for black Americans over the next 10 years. Again, focusing on people who don't have a four year degree. And what you'll find often is for African Americans, the normal sequence of getting a college degree and then getting a good job is reversed. Often people get their first job 
and they take advantage of the educational opportunities inside companies. So long story short, I think we have to break down the structural barriers that we have when we insist on credentials rather than skill sets. You know, Ken, it's clear that you're, you're a leader in, in doing the right thing and, and that the right thing is, I think, extraordinarily important uh, for corporate America and for the nation as a whole. Do you mind if I ask whether or not it has been difficult to do that since you represent a major company? Uh, I, I don't know whether I'm asking you about pushback, but sometimes many leaders have trouble doing the right thing because, um, because they hear about it. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I think it's very difficult for leaders of corporations in today's America, where we are so divided as a people, where we have such huge partisan uh, divisions in our country. Um, and I don't think CEOs are put in a position to take positions on every political issue, certainly not to tell their people what positions to take. But there every once in a while arise issues that I think go to the core of what our democracy is about. And I'll say that recently I've been very involved at the forefront of getting corporations to sign up to support voting rights inside this country. And I think it's a mistake for corporations to take democracy for granted. Uh, what allows us to do the work that we do is the stabilization of our society. And so when we don't insist on the fundamental tenets of democracy, and I would say the fundamental tenet of democracy is that everyone who's an eligible voter has a fair and equitable opportunity to cast their vote for the candidates of their choice and therefore uh, have a, an input in representative government. When we don't have that, uh, when we have the level of income inequality that we have in our country right now, um, when we have people attacking our fundamental institutions like our courts, um, I worry about the stability of our society. Uh, and for business to make long-term investments and plans, it depends on a stable environment. So I would just basically say it is hard to take these decisions when you're a CEO, uh, but I think that they're consistent with what's in the long-term interest of American business, which is again, a stable society. You know, I, I think sometimes as I've been thinking about uh, the situation that we're in, I, I think about uh, that famous Yeats poem that says uh, the, you know, the center will not hold. And it talks about anarchy being loosed. And it talks about how the best of us uh, have no conviction and the worst of us are full of passionate intensity. And it, it was actually written at the time uh, in 1919 when the world was going through the flu pandemic in 1919 and Ireland was having a civil war. And so its society was coming apart at the, at the seams, so to speak. And, and I just think if we think about what's happened in our country recently, and I would use January 6th and the Capitol insurrection as an example, I think we have to realize that if we do not take a stand for tolerance, reasonableness, uh, and for the things that fundamentally underscore our democracy, we can lose uh, the, the situation that we've had forever, peaceful transfer of power, rule of law, and all those things that business depends on. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I know so many uh, truly appreciate uh, your, your leadership uh, here. You know, one of the things we're proud of here at Penn State is that we rank number two nationally for producing CEOs and uh, ahead of some significant Ivies, I might add. Um, and and you, you said uh, in, in one of your earlier answers what... Um, what the opportunity to go to some exceptional schools in K through 12, how that, uh, how that made such a big difference. Um, can I ask about your college experience and, and, and whether there were particular things that Penn State, at Penn State that shaped your path? Absolutely. So I first, I came to Penn State, I had skipped two grades. I was a 16 year old freshman. Uh, and I came to Penn State from Philadelphia, the inner city of Philadelphia. And 
Penn State represented a period of transformation that influenced the rest of my life. You know, I just remember, for example, the first um, roommate that I had living in Tenor Hall in East Halls, uh, and Tom Fernsler was his name. Uh, he came from the Lancaster area. He was the son of dairy farmers. And I came from the inner city of Philadelphia. You could not have found two more different people. And in the first couple of nights, I remember thinking to myself, what will we ever figure out? How will we figure out anything to talk about? We're so different. But I have to say that that was a very important part of my development uh, in, in college. I met people like Tom, people who had so many different backgrounds and perspectives. And that has helped me later on uh, when I became a lawyer in particular, but also as a business executive, learning to understand people who are different and to develop relationships of trust and confidence with different people. I think Penn State provided me more than just the academic education. It was a strong academic education. It gave me the, the basis to go on to, to law school at Harvard Law School, but I always remind people I, I got over Harvard. Uh, the fact of the matter is Penn State gave me that opportunity academically, but more fundamentally, it did teach me that the world is very varied and diverse and that there's a lot of commonality between people. Again, Tom, son of a dairy farmer, Ken Frazier, the son of a janitor from North Philadelphia. We found out that when we opened up and talked, we had a lot more in common than we thought initially. And I think that was, to me, the most important part of my education at Penn State. Thanks, I appreciate that. You know, many of our conference attendees that are listening have a very strong interest in corporate venture capital. After all, we're really promoting entrepreneurship and venture capital is, is one of those tickets to, to the next level. Um, could you tell us about Merck's venture capital efforts? Yeah. So at Merck, we work with two main venture capital groups. Uh, the first one is our Merck Global Health Innovation Fund, which is a $500 million evergreen fund that particularly invests in digital health companies. Uh, GHI was first introduced uh, around a decade ago with the objective of giving us some insight as a company into how the digital health space was unfolding with the added value, of course, of potential expansion into you know, emerging segments of healthcare. With this fund, our teams have been able to look more closely at where we have patients with potential care gaps. We've been able to help physicians make more precise treatment decisions and improve care management through telehealth and things like remote monitoring. And although GHI tends to focus more heavily in areas of strategic interest for our business, such as oncology and vaccines, the fund has made over 50 investments over the past 10 years, including supporting the growth of some pretty important digital health companies like Livongo and Preventis. So that's the first fund. We've also committed more than $500 million to what we call MRL Ventures. MRL stands for Merck Research Labs. And those ventures were created to give Merck a unique lens into the most novel and potentially impactful areas of science and drug discovery allowing our company to be an active contributor to the biotech innovation ecosystem. Unlike the digital system, now we're looking directly in life sciences and we're investing strategically in innovative therapeutics companies uh, that work to develop transformative medicines and therapies. I would say that we had a great investment for a long period of time in a company called Moderna. You might have heard of them recently. Uh, so since our establish that establishment a few years ago, we've supported more than 20 early stage biotech companies across a broad range of therapeutic areas and modalities. And again, many of which have since advanced highly innovative new medicines and vaccines to the clinic and beyond to, to the public. So we're very interested in being on the cutting edge with our ventures. Yeah, that, that, uh, that truly is uh, significant. You know, one of the things that I'm struck uh, by uh, looking at Penn State entrepreneurial activities, particularly from our students, a surprisingly large number of them are health-related or, um, or, or uh, life sciences-related. And almost always the students are driven by having experienced a problem and wanting to fix it, which I yeah. find is a fascinating driver for entrepreneurship and 
and moving forward in this space. And, and, and it, I think it bodes well for health. I and think so too. You know, health expenditures are 20% of GDP now. And when people look at healthcare, they're generally dissatisfied with what we get. They just, we're dissatisfied with the health of our population. Individual patients are dissatisfied with the way in which health is provided, particularly because it's sort of provider centric. I will just say that my wife for a number of years had renal cell cancer and she's well now, but I remember when she was very sick, we had to take her from Philadelphia to New York to take her to Sloan, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. There was no way for her to get the treatment closer to home. And so I think there's these great opportunities in healthcare. Number one, to improve the patient experience, which is what you were referring to, Dr. Barron, but also to bend the cost curve in a way that allows us to spend our money more productively in health and have money to spend on other things. Because if, if health continues to grow as a percentage of the GDP, we're gonna to have to figure out what we don't want, right? We want universities, we want roads, we want airports. Uh, so we wanna have the expenditures on health create real value. And I think that's why you're seeing so much interest in this area, because I think health is, tends to be siloed and there's a great opportunity to create value across those silos. I, I totally agree, totally agree. Um, one other question, uh, this time uh, uh, submitted by uh, Bruce Booth, partner of Atlas Ventures and a Penn State Research Foundation board member. And, and he says, Merck's biggest product, Keytruda, was an early stage antibody, an unheralded piece of uh, intellectual property when it was acquired through a merger in 2009. Yet today, it's a blockbuster. So how do you manage an R&D strategy that is both focused and following something to a conclusion, but also have the flexibility for things that are, are serendipitous? Yeah, and you know, I think the context is important because you know, in our business, we fail more than 90% of the time, or put it differently, more than 90% of the projects that we think are good enough to invest in ultimately fail. Uh, and when the merger with Shearing Plow occurred back in 2009, uh, the composition of matter patent application for Katrina had been filed, uh, but we didn't know very much about this at all. And following the merger, we tried to be very deliberate in assessing the molecules in each company's pipelines. Uh, but, but I have to say, we did not know that we had this gem. We didn't understand it. And in fact, I had the opportunity to talk to two of the young uh, scientists who worked on Keytruda in its early stages, and they wanted to impress upon me how their bosses were telling them to stop the work they were doing because their bosses were not impressed with the potential. So I think it was important uh, for them to continue to work on this. And as the scientific community began to focus on immuno-oncology as a potential vector for saving patients who suffer from malignant disease, once we saw that, and again, that shows the connection with the academic community, then our scientists elevated the priority that they assigned to the development of Keytruda. Uh, and it became, of course, this blockbuster, as you say, or what we call a pipeline and a product because it's been able to be used across so many different cancers. It's the first uh, broad spectrum agent ever to be introduced uh, into clinical practice for cancer. Uh, and it's now become foundational uh, and it is used across, again, many, many cancers. Uh, it's in 93 markets around the world. And, uh, you know, many people, if you, if you pay attention to Wall Street, think it will, uh, by the end of its patent term, be the biggest pharmaceutical product in history. But that's not the most important thing to us. The most important thing is that we continue to make investments in Keytruda and other areas of science that will benefit millions of people but years in the future. So the way that I think about my job today uh, in 2021 is that I have to make the right decisions for Merck to be successful 10, 15, 20 years from now, because uh, you, know, you have to balance the needs of today's shareholders against the promise of tomorrow. Next is a question from Joel Seichi, a recent graduate of the College of information science and technology and founder of Vibrant, a social networking company that helps to break barriers for underrepresented students. And the question is, 
how do you and your community at Merck promote mentorship when uplifting black and brown folk? And how could startups like Vibrant build capacity to do the same? Let me start by saying what I said earlier, which is diversity and inclusion is very important. But it, it but saying those things, you know, saying you are committed to diversity and inclusion has enormous rhetorical appeal. The question is, what as a company are you doing to show that you really treat it as important and that you support every hiring manager, every leader, and every colleague uh, in a way that actually helps promote diversity? And that requires radically rethinking our approach in some of the ways that I talked about with respect to 110 and uh, you know, having, for example, a skills-based approach. Um, I will say also, by the way, uh, while the question had to do with black and brown people, I find that when we remove unnecessary barriers for one group, we actually help everybody by doing that. So what we've done recently is to ensure that all of our leaders are agreeing to take accountability to drive change and to ensure that uh, these people who struggle inside the company, and there's, there's no secret that African-Americans and Latino Hispanic colleagues struggle more than other colleagues in terms of their promotion rates and advancement. Um, but what we've asked people to commit to is to act as allies and sponsors and mentors for those people. You know, my own career advanced because when I was a lawyer, uh, I got hired by Merck CEO at the time, Roy Vagelos. He brought me in as a lawyer and then quickly switched around and said, I don't want you to practice law. I want you to come into the business. And I worked closely with him he gave me a lot of stretched assignments and opportunities to grow outside my legal background. And on my best day as CEO of Merck, I'm simply imitating Roy Vagelos. By being able to work closely with him, you could say it was an apprenticeship to be the CEO of Merck back when I was in my early 30s. We're talking about the early 1990s. It never occurred to me that I would one day be the CEO of this company for 10 years. But that access to the people who can make or break your careers and who can teach you uh, through their actions how to do these senior level jobs, those are so important. So what you're doing is important. I think it's really important to find ways uh, to advance people, but also it's also important to go back to the beginning of the talent pipeline and ensure that African-American students have the education needed to advance. So to be clear, I see two different gaps that black students and Latino students face in the country. The first one is what I call the opportunity gap. I talked about being bused to a good school. That closed the opportunity gap for me. Um, but the reason I'm the CEO is because I had access to Roy Vagelos, who was the CEO. That's a separate gap. That's what I call the access gap. So once you qualify to be in the company, it really does matter who you're associated with, you know, I'll just, I'm going on too long, but there was a really interesting survey uh, done a few years ago by LinkedIn. And what that survey showed is that when people get promoted to senior management or to board service in companies in corporate America, the first step is to assemble a team or a group, I meant to say, a collection of people who have the qualifications for the position. But after that first step, what makes a difference is the network effect. Who knows that person? And so as long as that network effect is in, is in play, many people who come from outside that network, and I'm now referring again to African-American and Latino Hispanic colleagues, they tend not to have the interpersonal networks that others have. And unless we force people to really open up that that circle and act as allies, sponsors, and mentors for African-American and Latino Hispanic colleagues, I don't think we'll ever have a fair and equitable environment for advancement within our company. I, I appreciate that. You know, I I know I I went, I know I went from the point of of realizing that that okay, I was working for someone and I knew who I admired and who I didn't to really realizing the extent to which uh, individuals were enabling me. Right. It, it makes, it just makes a tremendous, tremendous difference. Um, the next question that I find interesting as well, that's coming from the Penn State community 
because as I watch some of these young students uh, create their companies, I see they, they become acquired and, and it's sort of an interesting part of the process. So professors Sean Clark and Jeanette Miller from the Penn State Farrell Center for Corporate Innovation and Entrepreneurship in the Smeal College of Business um, are asking what is the role of mergers and acquisitions of startups in Merck's overall innovation strategy? So I would say that business development overall is an important priority for a company like Merck. Um, we are committed to discovery. We just built three new discovery labs, one in Cambridge, Mass., one in um, South San Francisco, and one at King's Cross in London. But we're under no illusion that we can do enough great science within our four walls to keep this company sustained. In 2020, we did about 120 transactions that span licensing, technology deals, clinical collaborations and acquisitions. We had some important acquisitions last year, including the acquisitions that led to our COVID programs. So we try not to be limited by the size of the deal, but I have a philosophy about these kinds of things. And that is that I think the most productive relationships are not necessarily acquisitions because the people who have a vision for these companies often want to see those companies reach their full, uh, full potential. And when you do an acquisition early on, you can seize the value of that company. The people in the company get rich, which maybe that may be what their goal is. But I, I like people who want to develop enduring companies. And so to have that opportunity, I talked about our relationship with Moderna for many, many years. We worked alongside them. We we're able to help them. And now they're a very strong company. And I, so I happen to think that, you know, while acquisitions and mergers are important, um, I, I do think that allowing these startup biotech and other science-based companies to follow their theories to the completion is also an important thing for science and not just buying people out, capturing the assets, bringing them in, synergizing the costs. I don't know that that's good for science in the long run. So at Merck, we're going to try to continue to focus on identifying the kind of science that will create sustainable value for our patients and our shareholders. But I think we can also help those younger companies reach their full potential and not nip them in the bud by buying them out. It makes sense. So I, I have a closing question. Um, in the last few months, uh, the two of us have both made a significant uh, personal and professional announcements. I suppose this is the opposite of, of talking about a startup. Right. And that is that they were both retiring. So have you thought about um, your legacy? Um, and have you thought about the new goals that you might set for yourself uh, post Merck? Well, you know, when people ask you about your legacy, that's really an indication that you've gotten very old. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm going to try to take that on. Yeah. Uh, but, but let me start by saying that People at Merck, all, all of them know uh, that the first thing that I read in the New York Times every single day is the obituary page. Uh, and the reason I read the obituary pages, it, most people think it's morbid, but it's not. It's a record of how people live their lives. And they capture the kinds of accomplishments that really matter. And so when it comes to legacy, uh, before I talk about business, you know, I think there's a difference between resume virtues, okay, and you might call them obituary virtues. Uh, because in the end, people are going to ask, you know, what kind of person were you? What were you kind? Did you care? Did you help other people? And so in that vein, I would like to believe that when people look at my tenure at Merck, we'll look at how much human suffering we alleviated at Merck. And we alleviated a lot of human suffering. You mentioned Ebola in, in the introduction. I'm very proud of that. When we took on the Ebola vaccine project, we knew we would never make money off that. But, um, you know, coming back to my earlier conversation, you know, whether you're talking about John Locke or Warren Buffett, they both talk about this random lottery of birth. And some people are born in areas of this world where they're completely disadvantaged, where there are huge health disparities, and I think what Merck has tried to do in my tenure is try to address a lot of those health disparities and relieve human suffering. And I think that's 
a positive thing. And beyond that, I hope I'm remembered as a good father. Uh, my wife and I've raised two wonderful children. And I hope that people will say that I stood up for what was right and didn't shrink from responsibility simply because you could be criticized for standing for what's important and what's valuable in life. So, you know, I'll just summarize just saying as CEO, I hope I upheld Merck's legacy and help ensure strong foundation for another 130 years for this company. Well, I, I think uh, your legacy is, is certainly assured and, and uh, um, I, I just really appreciate um, uh, your time and your willingness to serve as our keynote speaker and co-chair for this year's Invent Penn State Venture and IP Conference. I just wanna thank you for uh, from all of our attendees uh, uh, today. And I want to thank the attendees for joining us today. But President Barron, yeah? I have to interrupt because yeah, okay. I was on the Merck, excuse me, I was on the Penn State Board of Trustees when we sought a president. And I want to thank you for the contributions you've made to our, our, to our alma mater. Uh, coming out of a period that was not easy for us as, as a collection of people, you brought us to the highest level we've ever had. And I, I think you should be very proud that future generations of students, including first generations of students, will have the same experience that I had at Penn State. And for that, you should feel extremely good. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I love this institution. I, it, it has an attitude that personally just fits. It, it, it's always looking for the next thing and, and, and living that land grant mission and in service to society. And we've got an awful lot of people here that are really good and they're still asking the question, how can I be better? Uh, what can I do more? So I, I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, thanks, thanks. All right, it's well, a pleasure. Thanks. Um, Peace. <laughs> Peace, I agree, I agree.